So let's just pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we appreciate you for this room. We thank you for everyone here. We thank you for your, your word that you have given to us. You didn't leave us directionless. Thank you for an opportunity to sit at your feet, to learn about you, to understand you more. Um, for everyone who's going to speak, we ask that no one speak of themselves, but that they all speak of you in the mighty name of Jesus. Let only your voice be heard. Let no flesh glory in your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. For everyone here, give them a word for their season. In the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So hi everyone, if you are just joining us, welcome to the room. This is our Bible reading room. And we hold this from Monday to Friday, 6 a.m. West African time. Um, we're reading the Bible sequentially from Genesis to Revelation. So please make it a day to just Monday to Friday, 6 a.m. West African time. Today we're reading Genesis 18. So I'll open the text, I'll read, then we'll just share a few things from the text. So Genesis chapter 18, I'm going to read the Amplified Version. And it says, Now the Lord appeared to Abraham by the terebent trees of Mamre, while he was sitting at the tent door in the heat of the day. When he raised his eyes and looked up, behold, three men were standing a little distance from him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. And Abraham said, My Lord, if, I, if now I have found favor in your sight, please do not pass by your servant. Please let a little water be brought, and may you wash your feet and, rec and recline and rest comfortably under the tree. And I will bring a piece of bread to refresh and, and sustain you. After that, you may go on since you have come to your servant. And they replied, Do as you have said. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, Quickly, get ready three measures of fine meal, knead it, and bake cakes. Abraham also ran to the herd and brought a calf, tender and choice, and he gave it to the servant, and he hurried to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk, and the calf which he had prepared and set it before the men and he stood beside them under the tree while they ate then they said to him where is sarah your wife and he said there in the tent he said i will surely return to you at this time next year and behold sarah your wife will have a son and sarah was listening at the tent door which was behind him now abraham and sarah were old well advanced in years she was past the age of childbearing so sarah laughed to herself saying after i have i have become old shall i have pleasure and delight my husband being also old and the lord also and the lord asked abraham why did sarah laugh saying shall i really give birth to a child when i am so old is anything too difficult or too wonderful for the lord at the appointed time when the season for delivery comes, I will return to you, and Sarah will have a son. Then Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, because she was afraid. And he said, No, but you did laugh. Then the men got up from there and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham walked with them to send them on the way. The Lord said, Shall I keep secret from Abraham what I am going to do? since Abraham is destined to become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. 
for I have known him, so that he may teach and command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is righteous and just, so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has promised. And the Lord said, The outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great, and their sin is exceedingly grave. I will go down now and see whether they have acted as the outcry which has come to me, and if not, I will know. Now the men turned away from there and went towards Sodom. But Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Abraham approached and said, Will you really sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are fifty righteous people within the city. Will you really sweep it away and not spare it for the sake of the fifty righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to strike the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. Far be it from you, shall not the judge of all the earth shall not the judge of all the earth do right? So the Lord said, If I find within the city of Sodom fifty righteous, then I will spare the entire place for their sake. Abraham answered, Now behold, I who am but dust and ashes have decided to speak to the Lord. If five of the fifty righteous are lacking, will you destroy the entire city for lack of five? He said, If I find forty-five righteous, I will not destroy it. Abraham spoke to him yet again and said, Suppose only forty are found. And he said, I will not do it for the sake of the forty who are righteous. Then Abraham said to him, Oh, may the Lord not be angry, and I will speak. Suppose suppose thirty righteous people are found. And he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, Now behold, I have decided to speak to the Lord. Suppose only twenty righteous people are found there. And the Lord said, I will not destroy it for the sake of the twenty. Then Abraham said, Oh, may the Lord not be angry with me, and I will speak only this once. Suppose ten righteous people are found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of the ten. As soon as he had finished speaking with Abraham, the Lord departed, and Abraham returned to his own place. So just a quick recap. The Bible says Abraham was sitting at his tent door in the heat of the day. So, you know, Abraham did not build houses. He lived in tents, right? Because God could come and tell him to move anytime. And if you built a house, you can't carry the house. You have to leave the house. So he lived in tents throughout his life. He never built a house. Um, so in those days, it was very hot in, in the Middle East. It's still very hot. So when it was hot in the middle of the day, people didn't they didn't do anything. If you're a traveler and you let's say you used to travel in the wilderness, they usually traveled in the morning because it's cool in the morning. Then in the afternoon they just sit down and do nothing because it's very hot. Then they when it's evening, they travel again. Then when it's night, they set they set up their tent and they sleep. So in the it was the heat of the day, Abraham was just sitting down in in at the door of the tent because if you sit inside the heat is too much and if you sit outside the sun will scorch you so they sat by the door so he sat at the door of the tent and the bible says three men stood by him so they just appeared close to where he was and the bible tells us one of us one of the men was the lord right um the remaining two we'll see them in the next chapter they're actually angels so one was god and two were angels so when abraham saw them he got up, he ran towards them, he bowed down at their feet. They appeared looking like men, right? So Abraham bowed at their feet and he said, My Lord, please pass into my tent. Let me bring some water to wash your feet and some food for you to eat. So they agreed, they brought, they came to Abraham's tent. They sat down under a tree near the tent. So Abraham um, rushed into the tent, as the Bible says. He told Sarah to prepare bread basically so she said quickly prepare three measures of fine meal knead it and make cakes upon the earth so she made cakes for for the three men so he also went to his one of his servants he told the servant to 
to prepare it, he, he, he took a lamp and gave it to the servant to kill. Then he, Abraham, prepared the lamp for the Lord. Then he brought the lamp and gave it to the Lord. Um, and after after the men eat, right, they began to move towards Sodom and Gomorrah. So two of them left, the two angels left. And no, the two angels hadn't left at this time. So two angels were with God, right? And Abraham was with them. And God decided to tell Abraham what was going to happen in Sodom and Gomorrah. He told him that the iniquity of Sodom and Gomorrah was too much, right? And and that he was about to destroy the place. By this time, the two men had left and said, and they had started going towards Sodom. It was just Abraham and God. So Abraham began to negotiate with God. And he started saying, if, what if there are 50 righteous people? Will God destroy the righteous with the wicked? And God said, no, if he finds 50, he will not destroy it. Then he said, what if you find 45? And God said he will not destroy it. Abraham said, what if you find 40? Then God said he will not destroy it. What if you find 30? God said he will not destroy it. What if you find 20 righteous people? God said he will not destroy it. Then he said, what if you find 10? God also said, if I find 10, I will not destroy it. So that's where the conversation ended. Abraham stopped at 10. And God promised him that if he finds 10 righteous people, he will not destroy it. So he left Abraham. Right. And, and Abraham decided went back to his tent in between this god um he reaffirmed the promise he made to abraham in genesis 17 where he told him that sarah will have a child so when he said this, sarah was in the tent and she heard and the bible says she laughed because she was 99 um she was 90 years old and abraham was 99 so in her in her heart she said is it possible that I will still have children. In fact, by this time, she had stopped menstruating. The Bible says, and the manner of women had had ceased from Sarah. So she was not menstruating. They couldn't even have sex, right? She says, after I am wax old, shall I have pleasure? So they couldn't even have pleasure, man and woman pleasure. So it was that bad. So when God now told her that she will have a child, she laughed. And God says, why is Sarah laughing? Is there anything that is too hard for me to do? So when Sarah heard this, the Bible says she denied because she was afraid because God caught her laughing. Because the Bible says she laughed within herself. So she didn't laugh out loud. Right? But it's like she forgot it is God because they came as men. So she laughed in her mind. But you know, if you laugh in your mind, men can't hear you. But when she laughed in her mind, God now said, Why did Sarah laugh? So she was shocked that God heard her mind. So quickly she just denied that she didn't laugh. And God said, No. You laughed. But anyways, God said he will confirm his promise um, to her and she will actually be his son. Right. So just a few things. The Bible says that three men appeared to Abraham, right? But through discernment, he knew that these were not just men. So sometimes when we are asking God to come through for us in certain situations, he will not come through in the way you expect him to come through, right? Sometimes we've prepackaged how we want God to rescue us, how we want God to deliver us, or how we want God to answer a particular prayer on a particular situation. So we almost force God in a direction, right? But sometimes, right, when God shows up, he may not be exactly as you expect him to show up, but he will show up. It will take discernment to know that god has actually come to deliver me sometimes it's not as spectacular sometimes it's not with fire and brimstone and with a shooting star and with the sun very shining it, it sometimes he just comes through in an ordinary manner right it's like jesus when jesus was born there was no fanfare there was no i mean parade in the streets because they were expecting the messiah to show up as a king riding on horses with a train of servants following him and being a mighty military leader when he came looking so ordinary they missed him it was only those who had discernment that knew that even though this guy is just looking like one of us he's a carpenter right we know his father we know his mother we know his brothers right the bible even says of jesus that there was no beauty in him that we should desire him all these people who make Jesus films, I have sometimes, honestly, they don't read the Bible. 
So they make him looking so hard. They make him look so handsome. They truly don't read the Bible. If you read Isaiah 53, verse 5, the Bible says Jesus was not handsome. It says there was no beauty in him that we should desire him. So when you look at him, he was ordinary, like a very ordinary Israelite. Or as ordinary as all of them were. That's like there was nothing special about him. He was not even fine. He just looked normal. Because that's how God does these things. The Bible says, where is it? First Corinthians 1 26. It says that there is not there is not many mighty, not many wise, not many noble among you. But it says that God has chosen the weak of this world in order to confound the strong. God has chosen the foolish in order to confound the wise. It says God has chosen the things that are despised to confound the things that are not. So how God typically moves, right, is that he uses things that are little. He uses things that are small, right, so that when those things triumph over the things that are mighty, it is clear that God is in it. So if you study the people that God chose in the Bible, there were always nobodies. Anytime when God wanted to choose people, were people who didn't think they, they were worth anything. So when he, he came to choose David, he's the one that they, they put in the wilderness to be keeping sheep. He's the one that when Samuel saw him, he didn't, I mean, when he got there, they didn't even bring him out, right? They left him in the wilderness. The one that looked like soldiers, those are the ones they brought for Samuel. When God chose Saul, when Samuel said, Saul, you are the one that is anointed. Do you know what Saul said? Saul said, I am the least in my father's house. And even among the tribes of Israel, my tribe is the least. So his tribe is the least of all the tribes. Then even in his family, he is the least. He doesn't, he's not worth anything. When God chose Gideon as a judge, right? Gideon said the same thing. He said, my family is the least. He was like, is it, is it me you are going to choose out of everybody? My family is the least. Look for someone else. Of the disciples, they were not rich men. They were not mighty men. They were not respected men. They were ordinary people. Fishermen, right? Tax collectors. People, things, people that, I mean... People that other people hated or people people didn't respect. In fact, the Bible says of the disciples that they were unlearned men. So they didn't even go to school. The Bible says they were unlearned men. So he didn't even pick people who went to school. He picked the uneducated ones. The Bible says that, do you know why Jesus was born in Bethlehem? Because it was one of the smallest towns, smallest places. In Israel, the Bible says in Micah 5 verse 2, O Bethlehem Ephrata, it says, Do thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he comfort unto me who will be ruler in Israel. It says, because they were little, God made sure Jesus came through them. So God looks for people that are little, people that are despised, people that don't think they're anything, people that truly know anything. Those are the ones God likes using. Do you know why? Because when he uses them, it is clear God's power, His excellency is shown through those people because it's clear that this person is too small. When David kills Goliath, it's clear that God walked through him because he's just 17. He's just a boy. A boy can't kill a giant. So it's clear that there's a God behind him. When a small, small nation like Israel is defeating bigger nations, people who had been established before them people who had chariots these ones just came out of the wilderness where did they learn to fight they don't have horses they don't have chariots and they are defeating established cities like jericho then it is clear that god is behind them so god likes to use things that don't seem like they are anything seem like they are small seem like they, are, they, they don't have power they are not they are not qualified per se so that when he does it it is clear that it is his glory so people who are proud, God doesn't use them. People who already think that they are mighty in themselves, you know, I don't need God. I'm very intelligent. I'm very hardworking. I'm very smart. I have connections. I have money. I can I can preach very well. I can sing very well. I am very beautiful, right? I When I speak, I have the powers of oratory. I'm a very good public speaker. So people who already think that they are talented, they are skilled. They are full of the, those people. If you check them, there is no glory of God upon their life because their pride will not allow God to use them. Because when God uses them, they will not give the glory to God. They will come out and now start saying that I'm the one that is, I'm, this is my, this is my strength. It's because I went to school. It's because I'm. So those type, God doesn't use them. When people are proud, they are already lifted up in their heart. God can't use them.
but the ones who think who think that they don't they don't amount to anything god likes those types so in case you're in this room and god is calling you to do something that is big something that is mighty and you are now saying ah, i don't qualify that's what even makes you qualify the fact that you think you don't qualify is what makes you qualify the fact that you think that oh i can't do this this thing is not for me it's too big ah, i can't handle it if you if you were thinking you can handle it god will not have brought it to you so the fact that you think you can't handle it welcome to the club of god using those who on their own cannot do it so we have to have the mentality of humility so going back to abraham because how, how we came to this point is talking about how when jesus came he came very he didn't come in a way god was expecting so you have to be discerning when you're praying about certain situations you're praying about a husband he may not come with all the six packs i'm so sorry if you can hear those birds but he may not come with all the six packs and the way you are looking for him right you're praying about a job opportunity or a career opening the opportunity may not come in the way you're expecting right you're, anything you're praying about sometimes it takes discernment like abraham to know that these are men they, they look like men but god was it one was was with them so when the, the people came right if you notice throughout the whole conversation abraham didn't talk about isaac he didn't even bring up the fact that he's waiting on god for anything so it was god who brought it up by himself so he just saw the men he ran to meet them he said come sit at my tent he served them food he told sarah to bake cakes he slaughtered a lamb and while they were eating he just sat behind them i mean conversing with them right and when they were about to leave he walked with them so he didn't bring up the fact that he's actually waiting on god for it. if i if you read the story and you didn't read it to the end it will look like abraham doesn't have any prayer points so what this tells us that we have to get to a point where our entire fellowship with god is not about prayer points prayer is not for prayer points so you have to get to a point where you can fellowship with God even when He has not answered your prayer. You can have a meeting with God, right? You can go for your devotion, your personal time, and there are things you're waiting on God for. And at certain times, you can you can decide not to bring it up. You can say, in this particular devotion, this is just fellowship. It's just me and God. Let's leave the prayer point. For Let me just enjoy His presence. Let me just minister down to Him. Let me just worship Him. Because sometimes if, when you're really desperate for something, right, it can, that thing can take the place of your fellowship with God, where every time you enter God's presence, all you're thinking about, all you're talking about is the prayer point, the prayer point. So just, let's imagine this story, right? Imagine you're watching this, you're watching Abraham. Imagine he's just sitting down in front of the tent, then God comes, and as God is coming, Abraham just arises from the tent run straight to god he doesn't even bow he doesn't worship and he just says i thought you promised me a child 24 years ago so where is the child then he now opens scriptures and start quoting i thought you said that you are a faithful god he now opens the next one i thought you said that your word does not fall to the ground he now opens the next one i thought you said there's nothing too hard for you to do he now opens the next one i thought you said with god is everything is everything is possible so just imagine this scenario that god shows up you are watching abraham he rises up from his tent he runs straight to god he didn't bow he didn't worship he just started accosting god where is isaac where is the son i thought you did i thought you i thought wouldn't you see this man is it not god why are you behaving mannerless like this but this is how many of us behave you just enter god's presence you haven't no thanksgiving no worship you haven't praised him you haven't told him thank you no nothing the next thing i thought you said you were giving me a husband i thought you gave me a prophetic word that by now i'll have a job I thought you said I will relocate by now. I thought this promise, this so you just start pulling all the promises from nowhere. So, the same way you would have looked at Abraham, and he will look so mannerless. So imagine yourself in that situation. It's time for your devotion. You just enter your room. So you just close the door. You just start grumbling. Say, "Oh God, what kind of life is this now? Eh? Is it only me that is not prospering? Is it only me that that why is it only me that doesn't have money? I've been asking you to change my job for the past to the past eighteen months." It's over two, almost two years now. You've not changed the job. Oh God, please, please! Why you da, 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 cry, 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 cry? Then you finish. You didn't even fellowship with God. You didn't even look at His face. You didn't worship Him. You just left. Imagine if that's what Abraham did. He just came, accosted God for Isaac. 
grumble, complain, grumble, complain. Then when he finished, he went. He just went back to his tent. He will he, just imagine how the, how it will look. So, but this is not what Abraham did. He came to God. He started with worship, even though there is a prayer point that he has not gotten. He has not gotten anything. But when he got there, the Bible says he bowed himself to the ground. That was the first thing he did. He started with worship. After bowing himself to the ground, he now invited God to his to his to the to the tree near the tent. So God came, sat under the tree, and he began to what minister to the Lord. So what do you want to eat? Come and sit down. Let me give you some water. Let me wash your feet. So that is ministry known to the Lord. That's 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 what he was doing. He was worshiping God. What God? What are your own needs? You want you want to be worshipped. You deserve worship. I will worship you. I will praise you. I will give you thanks. I will glorify you. I will, I will tell you who you are. I will tell you how mighty you are. So that's what Abraham was doing. Communion, fellowshipping with God, talking with God, right? Hearing the heart of God. So in the process of doing that, right, God now is the one that now brought up the promise. So I'm not saying we don't ask God for things. I'm not saying we don't remind God based on based on what he has promised us, either through prophetic word or through the Bible. I'm not saying we don't present our needs. So what I'm saying is, we don't start with the needs. We start with worship, right? And we don't get to a place where the need has overtaken fellowship because we see how how much God desires fellowship. So do you know that God could God could have, what God could came to tell Abraham, right? He could have told him in a dream. He could have told him in a vision. He could have told him through word of knowledge. But he came down personally. Have you ever thought about that? He didn't need to come down by himself. All these things could have, could have been in a dream, could have been in a vision, it could be through word of knowledge, or he could have even sent an angel. Then you tell the angel, go and tell Abraham that by this time next year they will have a son, and also tell him that Sodom will be destroyed. So God will sit in heaven and send an angel. The angel will come and do it, and he will mind his, mind his business. But God came by himself. And when he came, he didn't just go straight to the point and say, I just came to tell you that by this time next year sarah will have a child and that sodom will be destroyed they immediately said those two things he just vanished and went back to heaven no he came and he was fellowshipping with abraham so god desires fellowship so imagine if god came to fellowship with abraham then abraham came and he's just asking for prayer point prayer point prayer point that god would god god loves him so god is going to meet his needs god is the one who even told him he would give him a son so it's not as if God is withholding the prayer point. So God came, let me fellowship with my son, whom I created, whom I love. The Abraham just comes and is rattling out scriptures like a gun. Do this one, do this one, do this one, ask for this one. He doesn't even bother to truly fell. That's what many people's prayer life has descended into. There's truly no time for fellowship. And when they appear before God, it's just to ask for things. You wake up in the morning, they just have five, ten minutes before they quickly go to work. So God protect me. God bless me. Today I must have money. I'll meet my covenant helper. Probably I'm believing God for a husband. So today I'll meet my husband. That's all they do in the 10 minutes before work. Brah. They've, they've catapulted. They've gone to work. When they come back in the evening, it's our time to ask God for new things. So God, thank you. But remember that I need a new house. I need a new car. They just sing one or two songs. They slept. The next morning they get up. They ask God for things. Protect me. Do this. Take, take me out. Bring me back safely. They come back at night. New job. New car. Just maybe one or two minutes of worship, just so that it's not too, you know, it's not too straightforward. We just do the religious things, enter into his gates with thanksgiving, his cause with praise. Just do two, 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 two minutes. Then the next thing it has, it has devolved into God, do this, God, do this, God, do this. So there is no real fellowship with God. Truly speaking, there is no fellowship. For many people, is either they don't have time, they don't create time to fellowship with God, or even when they go into God's presence, just to ask God for things. But we need to create time to fellowship with God. You need to give God priority, right, in your life. When you wake up in the morning, the first thing you do is not pick your phone. The first thing you do is fellowship with God. It's part of honor. It is dishonorable to God to wake up and pick your phone before you pray. It is utterly dishonorable to wake up, pick your phone, check Instagram before you pray. So imagine you are married to a man now. Right, you and your husband are lying down on the bed. So, two of you slept facing each other. Right, you're facing each other and you slept. Then when you woke up, your husband was staring you in the face, smiling. He has been watching you while you slept all night. So, he's, he has been just waiting for you to wake up 
so that you can have a conversation with you. And he was just smiling, admiring you while you slept. So immediately you woke up, you saw him smiling at you, waiting, expecting a hug, a kiss, whatever. Then you just pick your phone and turn your back and first check all your Instagram messages, check your DM, check your Snapchat, check your email. You know the workaholic type. I'm very efficient. So check your email. The proposal I asked them to send have they sent it. Then when you do this for 10 minutes, you now drop your phone and turn back and face your husband. Is that not dishonorable to your husband? And this is a man. This is not God. So people wake up. They think first fruit is only money. So you just wake up. Let me give my first fruit of money, my first salary, whatever, whatever. What of the first fruit of your day? Who gets that one? So you dishonor God for 31, 31 days of the month. Then you just come once on day or once a year. Because this first fruit, is, I think is once a year. People do it. I don't know. So once a year, you give God first fruit of your, your salary. But throughout the day, you throughout the year, you dishonor God. You wake up, the God that watched over you while you were sleeping. You know when I was saying your husband was watching over you? You don't know God to watch over you while you slept. He says he that never slept nor slumber. He never, he neither slept nor slumber. He doesn't sleep, he doesn't slumber. The Bible says he watches over Israel. We are Israel. We are Abraham's seed. So when he says he, behold, he watches over Israel. He doesn't sleep, he doesn't slumber. It is us. So while you sleep all night, God was smiling at you. Your husband from heaven watching you caring caring for you then you woke up and the first thing you are doing is, is checking your instagram that's dishonorable utterly dishonorable so you don't start your day on instagram check all this this these foolish things we do in this gen z generation even we that are not gen z we are now behaving like gen z you wake up first pick your phone check all the social media check everything when you now finish you know say okay it's time to pray what kind of life is that so we, we must create time with god we must we must create time for god when you come back home too, you must also create time for God. During the day, you must create time for God. Even if it's 10 minutes while you're in your office, take 10 minutes, go to the toilet and say, God, I just came to have fellowship with you. Read the Bible verse, pray 10 minutes, you come out. When you're coming back from work, if you drive yourself, hallelujah, and you're alone in your car, you can pray some worship. Worship, who says you can't worship God while driving? Who says you can't listen to the audio Bible while driving? If you don't drive, maybe you take an Uber or you take a bus. You have earphones. Put the earphones in your ear. Play a scripture. Go to YouTube. Look for your favorite preacher. Play a message. And when you get back home, create also, also create time for, we call it night devotion. Create time for God. You must have a specific time when you meet God. Any time is no time. If you say, I just pray at any time. Anybody who says, I pray at any time. They, they don't have, there's no time. Any time is no time. What it does when you create a specific time for God is that it ensures consistency. It ensures discipline. That's what it does. So if I say I pray at 10 p.m. every night, what that does is it reminds, it reminds me that I have a meeting with God at 10. That's what it reminds me. So if I'm on the phone gisting with Isabel and it's 9.45, I'll now start telling her, Isabel, I actually need to go. I pray by 10. So that covenant time will make sure I don't gist into the night. Maybe when I finish praying, I can come back and gist. But if I don't pray by 10 and I just say, I just pray any time. When it's 9.45 and I'm gisting with Isabel, we'll keep gisting, gisting, gisting. We'll gist till it's 11. And when it is 11 and I'm so tired, I've already given Isabel my strength. Then when I get up, I'll just do one sleepy prayer for five minutes and I'll land on the bed and sleep. If my covenant time is 10, right? And I'm watching TV. When it's 9.50, I now have to put off the TV. There's something that will make, because I know that this is time between, it's, it's between me and God. So it will make me put off the TV and go and pray. When I come finish, I can come back and watch TV. If I pray by 10 and I'm outside by 9.30, I now, start have to, I now will have to make my way back home because it's a time between me and God. If I fix the meeting with, in my office, I won't delay it. I can't come late. So between me, the one between me and God, I also can't come late. So if I'm out by 9.30, I have to find my way back home. So that specific time has given me consistency. It has ensured diligence. It ensures dedication to God. So you must have a specific time. There's not like I pray anytime. There's nothing like that. Anything that is serious in your life has timing. There's not like come to work anytime, resume anytime, or you're going to court, you appear at court anytime. There's not like any time. So if it's with God, you must have a time. You must be consistent. So. We have to create time for God. We have to honor God. I repeat, we have to honor God. All these foolish things we do. Someone is praying. He didn't put his phone on silent. 
all these foolish things we do. Someone is praying, he didn't put his phone on silent. So in the middle of the prayer, someone now calls him. He's talking to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Father of Spirits, the Creator of the heavens and the earth, God Almighty. In the middle of talking to God, his phone will ring. They will not pick the phone. <laughs> God has suffered in human beings' hands. He will not pick the phone and say, hello, let me call you back, let me call you back. This same person, if he's in a meeting with his boss and they call him, he dares not pick the phone. He dares, this is a human being, he dares, he can't try it. But he's talking to the king of kings. Then there's a notification on Instagram, while reading your Bible, you now click the notification, leave the Bible, go to Instagram, scroll for five minutes and come back. It's a slap on God's face. Because you can't do that to your boss in the office. That he's talking to you, your boss. Then you just hear bam notification Instagram. Then you now to your, you now pick your phone while your boss is talking to you. you now open Instagram. You can't do it to your boss, but you can do it while reading your Bible. You can't have a meeting in your office with a client, a high power client, and your phone is not on silent. It's an abomination. But people enter God's presence, their phone is not on silent. Notification is not off. So in the middle of prayer, their phone will ring. They will not leave God. God, leave God. Pick the phone, talk to their friend, drop the phone, continue the prayer. You won't go far with God. There is no honor. There is no reverence. Someone is going for a job interview. He can't enter that interview with his phone not on silent. It's not possible that you have an interview. You didn't put your phone on silent. It can never happen. But these are ordinary men. So people honor men more than they honor God. But someone will enter God's presence. In the middle of the prayer, he will pick his phone. But if you are in an interview, let's say you are able to interview. And you forgot to put your phone on silent. If the phone rings, you are so apologetic. I'm so sorry. You're looking at the interviewer's face. You're like, oh God, hope they won't deduct my marks. Hope I'll still get this job. I'm so sorry. I forgot. You don't even check who is calling. Whether it's your mom, whether it's your dad, you don't care. You just quickly put the phone off and say, okay, no problem. I'm I'm back. I'm back. Sorry. But in God's presence, someone will pick his phone. His phone will ring. You will not first pick the phone. You will look at it. You will not call his friend. You will not say, okay, please, I'm actually praying. So if God was so important, you, you in an interview, you won't pick the phone. You won't. But with God now, you can tell God to hold on first, to even answer the person and come back. It's dishonorable. You don't do that. So many times we reverence men more than we reverence. All this is just mouth. It's just mouth. You see people on the on the on Instagram, even in church. I'm shocked. Someone is inside church, he's typing messages on WhatsApp. But when he's going for visa interview, he wants to relocate. He cannot try it. That in the middle in the middle of the visa interview, he opens his WhatsApp and while he's facing the, the panel. He's not sending, but in God's presence, someone opens WhatsApp. It should not be done. So we see another thing about Abraham. When God came to visit him, you see the what's the word? You see the the enthusiasm with which he does the things of God. So when God came, sorry, I'm looking for the verse. When God came, right? And he ran. The Bible first said he, he didn't walk towards God when he saw God and the two men. He ran. He ran to God and he bowed and said, please come, come to my tent. Let me fetch water. Let me give you a morsel of bread. And he said, no problem. They came. So when they came, the Bible now says, and Abraham hastened into the tent onto Sarah. So he was in a hurry. Sarah, Sarah, where are you? Please make food quickly, quickly, quickly. After he did that, the Bible now says, and Abraham ran onto the head and fetched the calf so look at what happened he saw god he quickly ran he bowed down god god please come come and fellowship come on and when god came he ran again to this is a 99 year old man see he's running like a child 99 year old father he has this meal he's rich he's wealthy he's important running up and down because of god so he ran to god from there he ran to sarah this is imagine a 99 year old man running he ran to sarah quickly quickly bake cakes god has come Bake quickly he's running from there he ran onto the head that's where his cattle and sheep is he ran quickly told somebody bring a calf they brought it they killed it abraham himself himself dressed that calf for god this man has over 300 servants so he could have easily told one of them you know what you know i'm an important guy quickly kill this calf meet me in front of the tent bring it do it for come and save god he himself dressed it and ran back and said, God, see the enthusiasm with which he's doing the things of God. But we now, we dishonor God. We are too big for God. We are too, people doing the things of God, they do it anyhow. Do devotion, they do it anyhow. Have prayer meeting, they do it anyhow. 
right? They can come late. They can. They won't go late to work, but they will go late to church. When they go late to work, they are so apologetic. I'm so sorry I came late. They come late to church. They just stroll in, shaking their bum bum, and sit down, and it's not a big deal. So you see the way on. See see the way Abraham is doing the things of God honorably, with enthusiasm, with all his strength. We must learn from him. We must. So, again, God came to Sarah and said, <laughs> He said, Sarah, you, you now said Sarah will be a child in her old age. And Sarah laughed. Well, I just laughed. That's how Sarah laughed in her mind. You know, sometimes the unbelief, you don't even have to voice the unbelief, right? You just do it in your, in your mind. When God makes you a promise on you, in your mind, like, Kai, I don't think this thing can work, sir. I'm not sure God can do this. That's what Sarah did. She laughed in her mind, and God said, "Why? Wherefore did Sarah laugh? Say, shall I bear a child?" So you, you need to imagine Sarah's situation. This woman is ninety years old. The Bible says that the manner of women had ceased to be with Sarah. It says it had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So she she has passed menopause. I believe that's what they call it when women don't menstruate again. I'm not a woman. I don't. She had passed menopause. That's what the Bible calls the manner of women. So she doesn't menstruate. She now goes on to say, shall I indeed have pleasure? So by this time, they can't even have sex. They can't sleep with each other. Yet, God says they will have a son. So this kind of situation where all her breasts have sagged. No 90-year-old woman now. All her breasts have sagged. There's nothing going on down there. Abraham too. Everything, nothing is working. When they lie down, they just lie down and nothing happens. Then God now comes and says they will have a child. So she does. She, she she now laughed and said, "I'm not sure this thing is possible." And God said, "Is there anything too hard for me to do? Is there anything too hard?" So what God is saying to you now, you, your situation may look like it's hopeless, but it cannot be more hopeless than two people who can't have sex. It cannot be more hopeless. It can never be more hopeless than two people. What? Where is the hope? At least if you can have sex with your husband, you can say, "Okay, maybe one day." somehow somehow the child will come but if you can't even sleep with each other where is the baby going to come from how how where is it coming from so it looked like an utterly hopeless situation right but god showed up did they have a child they had a child do you know how difficult this miracle is that means that abraham's whatever that was not working has to start working so it's not like god just threw the child into her stomach it his his whatever that was not working has to start working Sarah's zone too. She has to start menstruating again. The breasts that have sagged by miraculous power, they come back, they they have life in them to a point where they can breastfeed the baby. This is a powerful, impossible miracle. So it's it's almost like people came back from the dead because the Bible even says that Abraham's body was dead. Sarah's womb was dead. That's how powerful this miracle is. So who says your situation is dead that God cannot rescue it? Who says you've gone too far? Who says it's too difficult? It's never too difficult. But like Sarah, you have to believe God. Maybe you've laughed in the past. No problem. Maybe you had unbelief in the past. No problem. Sarah laughed. God didn't condemn her. He says, why did you laugh? She even lied on top and said she didn't laugh. Face to face lying to God. Face to face. It's not like God is in heaven. Good. She's on earth. Face to face. But God should have mercy. And what he wanted to do, he still did. So believe God, right? No matter how hopeless your situation is, it's, it's not too hard for God. So, God now later began to explain to Abraham that Sodom and Gomorrah will be destroyed. So, do you know the funny thing about this story? The very funny thing is that the one that was in Sodom, God didn't tell him anything that where he's staying is going to be destroyed. So, the lot that is inside Sodom, this man is in Sodom, his wife is in Sodom, his children are in Sodom. His sons in laws, they are in Sodom. His business is in Sodom. His friends are in Sodom. His school is in Sodom. Everything that he, he, he is is in Sodom. God didn't even, even hint him that, oh boy, something they happen now. Or as we say it in Nigeria, something is going to happen. No, God didn't tell him. The one that does not stay in Sodom is the one that God now came to inform personally that Sodom is going to be destroyed. How does that make sense? That the one who is actually going to be affected by the destruction in Sodom, he heard nothing. God didn't tell him nothing. It was only, he didn't even have an idea 
that something is going to happen. But the one that is not outside is not in Sodom. The one that, even if they destroy Sodom, is not really his business, apart from Lot. But he doesn't have any real personal thing in Sodom. How, how did he hear it? And the one that's in Sodom did not hear it. It's because one is prayerful, the other one was prayerless. So Lot was a prayerless man. If you study the life of Lot, not once did the Bible says, and Lot built an altar unto the Lord. Not even once, not once did the Bible say, and Lot built an altar unto the Lord. Or did the Bible say, and Lot offered sacrifices unto the Lord. Or did the Bible say, and Lot began to call upon the name of the Lord. Not once. He's, an, he's a righteous man, as the Bible says, but he's an utterly prayerless Christian. So things just happen to him. They just call him and say one of his family members just died. He doesn't even know. He didn't because he doesn't pray. He can't see in the spirit. They just call him. They say he just lost your job. They just call him. Someone is, in his family just had cancer. Someone just sleep. Things, strange things are just. So, do you know that if Abraham was prayerless, that's how they would just call him one day and say, Kai, Kai, Kai. Do you know that Lot, your family member, he just died in Sodom? And he would be like, What? He didn't hear it. They would just call him. Do you know they just sacked you in your office? They would just call him. This one just happened. This one just happened. Strange things would just be happening. And it will look like, where is God in all of this? That's what would have happened to Lot. That's what would have happened to Abraham if he was a prayerless man. But he was a man of altars. And on the strength of his altars, he can discern in the spirit that calamity is coming. The Lord who is a prayerless Christian, always on Netflix, always on Instagram, playing video games, watching football, he does not know what's going to happen the next day. So things are perpetually happening to him. He can't discern anyone from in the spirit. He doesn't know left from right, from right. He's constantly in trouble. God has to constantly be delivering him. So he lacks discernment and he lacks it because he doesn't pray. And it's only because of Abraham, who is a prayerful person, that God delivered Lord. So when people don't pray, they can't see into the spirit. They, God cannot even lead them. God cannot say go left, don't go right. So they are constantly hitting the wall constantly making mistakes, constantly entering situations they should not enter, constantly saying, had I known, I would not have done this. When you are always saying, had I known, I don't, had I known, had I known, had I known, it's, it's proof that you don't pray. Because lots would have been saying, had I known, I would not have come to Sodom. That's what you would have been saying, had I known, I would not be here. But the one who prayed, God told him to stay in Hebron. Abraham, he didn't just jump. Lord did pray, he just jumped, he entered in Sodom and destroyed himself. So, the, this lack of discernment is a lack of prayer. You know, somebody was telling me a story one day that that one day she wanted to go out, right? She gathered, let me use another example. So, so I was heard the story about someone, he wanted to travel, right? So while he was traveling, it was a road trip. He was traveling, I think his, his car first stopped, right? So when his car stopped, he now came down, then he opened his boots, his, his bonnet, he checked, he checked, he checked, he managed to fix the car. He continued driving. After like two hours, his tire burst. So when his tire burst, he now came down and said, Car, I think that God does not want me to go on this trip, right? So he now called the people, I think he called the people and everything, like, so I'm not coming, no. you know, when I was coming, the first thing, my car stopped. The second thing, my tire burst, so I'm not coming. So the people were like, ah, it's even good, safe that there are armed robbers on the way, so it's even good that your car stopped. God didn't want you to come. That guy lacks discernment. If God has to stop your car first before you know that God didn't want you to go on a trip, you lack discernment. You lack discernment. This this one is a true life story. I, I saw this one is a real true life story. There was a guy he wanted to travel to, so he left his hotel. He was going to the airport, but when he was climbing down the stairs in the hotel, he fell and broke his leg. So they had to rush him to the hospital, and right. I don't know, do if surgery for the broken leg and whatever. He was so he was grumbling, complaining, God, why did I want to travel? What's this? What's this? Well, they now brought him back to his hotel, right? When they brought him back, he put on the TV and saw that the plane he was going to enter crashed. Everybody died. So God had to literally break this guy's leg <laughs> in order to stop him from entering entering the plane. It's because he lacks discernment. If he doesn't lack discernment in his time of prayer, he will sense that he should not go on this trip. So when you hear people say that. For instance, ah, I was trying to do this thing, it didn't work. Then later I found out it's God that did not make it work. You lack the same thing. For, for God to be make, not making things to work first. Because if Jesus was on earth, God would not have to break Jesus' leg before he, he, Jesus knows that I should not be traveling today. God does not have to stop Jesus' car on the road before Jesus knows that God actually did want me to do this. Someone enters a relationship, 
it's after it breaks you know go with the person and come back and say that thank god 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 did not allow this relationship if you had the same mate you would have no god didn't want you to go there first you didn't have to go there waste five years of your life dating the guy lose your virginity waste your emotions come out insecure before you now come out and say god was not in it you lack discernment you lack discernment so all this thank god it didn't work i was trying it thank god it didn't work we have to grow from that level to a point where we understand what god wants us to do per time because Abraham was not just traveling, trying different things. You just do this one, you say, thank God it didn't work. Thank God. There's nothing like thank God it didn't work. By the same he knows what God wants him to do. You didn't see Jesus just bringing random disciples, just picking random people. Then anyone that works, you now say, yes, this one is part of my disciples. God ordained it. Anyone that did not work, he now says that, okay, it's, it's good that God didn't allow. That, that, that's childish. So we need to, that, that is childish. If you, 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 maybe you try something, it doesn't work, and say, okay, ah, ah, no, no. So, we need to understand where we are supposed to grow to because if you don't understand where you are supposed to grow to you will you will be comfortable where you are so you can't be comfortable at, at a point where it's only when things don't work that you know god does not in it it's only when god breaks a relationship that you know that god did not want you to, to date the person in the first place it's only when maybe you were going somewhere and your, your tire bust or you were trying to call someone and the network did not go through or you applied to a school and all, all those kind of things we need to go to it. The Bible says, do you know what the Bible says? My sheep hear my voice. God calls us sheep. So sheep, do you know how sheep follow the master? They don't go left, go right, go left, go right. They anyone that walks, they now say, okay, this way. No, as the master is moving, the sheep, they understand what the master wants him to do, what them to do. So they follow the master. They just follow him. As he's moving, they follow him. They move in the direction he's moving. So the ones that go left, go right, then is when it doesn't work that they know the master doesn't want is goats or cows. You see when people are leading goats, the goat does not listen to the master. So he just does what he wants. So when the goat goes left, the master will flog the goat and say, no, come back this way. Then the goat will turn. Then he will go the next way. Then the master will flog the goat. Then he will say, come, come back. And it's by flogging that the goat now understands what the master wants him to do. So if God has to be breaking your leg, stopping your car on the road, breaking relationships, then you are not behaving like sheep. Because sheep know, he said they know my voice and they follow me. It's a straight line. They know where we are going. It is cows that will just be going different direction. They will be flogging them and say, no, come back, come back. You flog the, come, come, do this one. No, 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 no. We need to grow to the point where we discern the voice of God. The Bible calls God, see, the Bible calls God a good shepherd. If you study the life of the children of Israel, as long as you listen to God, they were not entering trouble left, right, left, right, left, right. God was leading them he was leading them so they were not just falling into ditches the bible calls god a good shepherd you can't see a good shepherd leading a sheep tomorrow the sheep fell into today the sheep fell into a ditch tomorrow the sheep fell into water next tomorrow the sheep fell off a cliff the sheep is just injuring himself breaking his leg getting torn by what no god leads the sheep and he keeps him in green pastures so people who are led by god they are not constantly in trouble not constantly begging God for deliverance. Not constantly doing the wrong thing, constantly going the wrong direction. No, because he is a good shepherd. God warns people before things happen. There's no way in the Bible where, for instance, children of Israel were just sitting down, then an earthquake does, or their enemies just came and destroyed them, or God didn't warn them through a prophet that this is what's going to happen. Prepare yourself. There's no way that Joseph and Mary would just be sleeping, then Herod would just come and kill Jesus. God didn't warn them. It's not possible. It's not possible. Or something about to happen to Abraham. Someone just came and go and God didn't want. No, God always warned people. So if God, if things are just happening to us, bad news, so different, different things. It's not like God is not warning us. It's that we are not prayerful enough. We are not. Pre- we don't spend enough time praying so that when God speaks, you can even discern that God is warning you. Don't go on this trip. Don't take this job. Don't make this person your friend. Don't date this person. Because the Bible calls him a shepherd. So he can't watch you just be going through pain, stumbling, and he doesn't warn you. If you are not being warned, you are not praying. Because God came to warn Abraham, Lot did not hear. It's not as if God didn't want Lot to hear so that he can die in Sodom. It's because he's, he never, there's not once in the Bible that the Bible says Lot prayed. He, his prayer life was, he's a Christian. He's right, but his prayer life was dead. So strange things were happening to him. So Abraham was a man of prayer. And by prayer, his prayer even covered his family. Do you know what this tells me? If you are prayerful, your family member should not die. 
truly speaking, you can't be hearing all this kind of strange, strange news. Oh, they, this one just happened. This one just, just sacked this one. This one has this strange disease. Strange, strange. By prayer, Abraham covered even Lot in Sodom. His prayer was so powerful that if there were other righteous men, God would have saved them. Even Lot's daughters that were not righteous, God saved them because of Abraham. By prayer, he covered his family. There are other examples of people in the Bible who by prayer, they covered everybody around them. The Bible says of Elisha that by prayer, he covered the entire nation of Israel. Nobody could attack Israel because Elisha was there. So they, they will plan that they will attack Israel from the left. When Elisha is praying, he will, he will hear them and he will warn the king. They plan they will attack them from the right. When he's praying, he will, warn, he will hear it. He will warn them. They did it like three times. Every time they tried to attack, they could not surprise them. And they were like, what was happening? Is somebody spying on us? Until one, somebody now told the king that there is a prophet in Israel. His name is Elisha. As you plan it, when he prays, God shows him. The Bible says of, of Apostle Paul, he entered into a boat. The boat was about to capsize. Everybody was afraid. Paul got up and said, the God whom I serve has given your life into my hands. None of you shall die. He told them that when I prayed, God promised me that nobody shall die. So because Paul was in that boat, not one person died. He covered them by prayer. He covered them by prayer. The Bible says of Job that he offered sacrifices on behalf of his children. When Satan came, the Bible says there was a hedge around Job, not around him and his family members. The hedge was around only Job. The Bible says when they came to arrest Elisha and Gehazi, the Bible says Elisha prayed and said, God, open the eyes of Gehazi. So when Eli uh, Gehazi's eyes were opened, the Bible says there were chariots of fire round about Elisha. The chariots of fire were not round about the two of them. The chariots of fire were round about Elisha. So if Gehazi was alone, then Gehazi would have died. Two of them are serving God. Two of them are prophets. Two of them are Christians. One is prayerful. One is prayerless. One is defended, one is defenseless. They can't sack one anyhow, they can't sack the other one. Covid can catch one, Covid can't catch the other one. One is family members, can strange things can be happening to them. The other one, nothing can happen to him because he's a prayerful man. The Bible says of Samuel, that because of Samuel, the hand of God was perpetually against the Philistines. So because Samuel was alive and he uttered his voice in prayer, the Philistines could not travel over Israel. They could not defeat them. Why? Samuel, a man of intercession. That's what intercession is standing in the gap for other people that's what abraham did he stood in the gap for lot this prayer does not concern him he's not in Sodom, but by prayer he covered his family so when people, christians are prayerless they are utterly there's nothing like oh we're christian god will save you there's not like that though if you don't pray you're on your own if you don't pray you'll be surprised god will mercifully deliver you like he delivered lot but you will suffer loss your farm your property can be destroyed lot suffered lot his property was destroyed everything he worked for went because he was a prayerless man so we must make time for prayer. Prayer is powerful. Prayer is our defense. Prayer is our insurance system. Things are too crazy now not to pray. People just go out. Someone just carries a gun, enter a supermarket, shoots everybody, shoots the children. Just, it's, it's a crazy world. So you need to pray. We don't do things with, with our physical brain. You must be a man of prayer. You must be a woman of prayer. Pray for yourself. Pray for your wife. Pray for your family. Pray for your children. You must make prayer a lifestyle. You must constantly be at the altar. You must constantly be interceding for your family members when you pray what you do what you do is you sharpen your discernment you sharpen your spiritual senses so the things that were not clear before they become clear the voice of god that was not clear that i'm wondering is it god is in my mind it becomes clear your eyes in the spirit open your ears in the spirit open so you can pick the signals things don't surprise me god shows me things before they happen before they happen because things don't just happen Things don't just, before even people enter my life, God shows me. Before opportunities come, God shows me. So I know what to do and when not. I even warn my family members don't do this. Sometimes they don't listen, but they see it later. But it's not because I'm special, but you must pray. God is a shepherd. He doesn't just allow people to just be entering trouble. If you are just entering trouble, just entering calamities, you are not praying. 